We want to welcome you to our online service. We are so thankful that you have taken time to join us for this evening's Bible study. Let us know in the chat box where you're watching from. Before we begin, we just wanted to remind you that you can connect with us online at www.champ.org. And you can also download our app in the App Store or Google Store. Of course, we would love for you to join us this Sunday on campus for a great worship service and encouraging message from our pastor. We also have some great activities planned for the kids. If this is your first time with us, we would love to connect. Just text FTG to 281-201-1719 to get connected. If you would like to join us in taking this message around the world, you can partner with us in giving. It's as easy as texting the word GIVE to 281-305-0505 or by going to our website, www.champ.org and clicking the Give Now. Again, thank you for joining us online. We pray this Bible study encourages and empowers you. Hello, I'm Andrea Smalley, head of school at Heritage Preparatory, located right here in Northwest Houston. Heritage Prep is a classical Christian school that believes in taking a stand for the children of our community and their education. It's our desire to provide a safe, Christ-centered learning environment where your children are free from the heavy weight of secularism. Heritage Prep prides ourselves on academic excellence with a proven rigorous curriculum. We offer a 12-acre facility, the option for hot lunches prepared by nationally recognized professional chefs, an on-site medical clinic, and Ninja Kids physical education from a real American Ninja Warrior, Coach James. We're committed to making Christian education accessible to all children in our community. As an exclusive offer for visiting us today, if you enroll your child, we will waive your registration fee. That's right, if you enroll today, we are waiving the registration fee, $150 in value, but you must enroll today. As we embark on this endeavor, please pray with us for the children of our community and their education. If you would like to learn more about Heritage Prep and how you can enroll your children, please click on the link and visit us at www.heritageprephtx.com or you can call our offices at 832-510-8767. Together, we can guard the hearts and minds of our children. I've got something in my hand that as good a friend and ministry partner as I have in the world, the incomparable Dr. Wendell Hutchins, the assistant general overseer of City Harvest Network, has a brand new book out. And you, believe me, you want to get your hands on it. It is a Holy Ghost guide to how to bring people back into victory, back into the house of God, back into strong disciples of Jesus Christ. Being that, it's called Kicking the Stars, Rediscovering Our Trust in God in the Midst of Crisis. Um, unbelievable wisdom in this book. And I had the privilege of doing the forewords right there. It's got my name on it right there. Dr. Rod Parsley had the privilege of doing the great, great forward in this tremendous book. Now, I want to encourage you to get a copy, and I know when you do and realize the breath of fresh air it is in these troubled times, Dr. Hutchins encourages all of us to get outside the tent of our constraints to look up, to expand our vision. This is a time to grow and explode and kick the stars. So I want you to get it. I know when you read it, you'll want to get copies for your leaders and so forth. So make sure you do that. I want to speak to you this morning about the uprising. And I want to hopefully start helping you identify the remnant community of faith that is in the earth. We go no further than the beautiful corpus that is written to the Galatians, Paul taking his pen and writing with the authority of an apostle, but with the brilliance of a poet. He says, I, Paul, an apostle. And my apostleship is not derived from human sources, nor did it come through a human being. It came through Jesus the Messiah and God the Father who raised him from the dead and the family who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus the Messiah our Lord. 
who gave himself for our sins. Notice, singular. Jesus Christ. Oh, y'all not praying with me. Our Messiah. And God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory to the ages of ages. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning in light of this past week's horrific school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. We've seen enough, we've heard enough, we've witnessed enough, and now it's time for somebody to say it. We are prompted to ask on the heels of such horror, is there a rise in demonic activity? Is our culture experiencing nothing less than a demonic uprising? Are we seeing a demonic attack? We're now learning from documented accounts and articles that there has been an unprecedented surge in exorcisms since 2021. I want you to hear this analysis very carefully. This is so unprecedented that it's being called, and I quote, a historic amount of exorcisms, end quote, going on in the U.S. and throughout the world, chiefly in Europe, South America, and Latin America. There are psychologists who are now saying that they are encountering demons and demon possession in their practices. Now, this is fascinating to me. Never before has psychology said anything remotely close to this, given their secular training. They have historically believed that to admit such a thing as demonic activity would be to admit a belief that was born out of archaic medieval thinking. You see, what we're seeing is a convergence of the old with modernity. We're seeing a collision between the archaic and the new thinker. We're seeing a new culture embrace a medieval philosophy. Ladies and gentlemen, what we see going on in our society today is far beyond politics. And it's beyond the prescription and the pills of medical doctors. There is not a pill that can manage or cure it. What we're seeing today cannot be cured by legislation and it will not be cured by a pill. We're all watching our own civilization's destruction unfold before our eyes. In fact, the only possible explanation that a lot of esteemed expert minds are coming up with is what we're dealing with, and they're calling it a demonic revolution. Experts, philosophers, scholars, and doctors, and chemists, and physicists are all joining in to say what we're witnessing is demonic, and it's the first time secular voices have admitted secularism has failed. To many people, the belief that is being proffered now about demonic revolutions is is a ubiquitous one. Though it's mysterious indeed, they're they're bound up in the mystery of it. They, They recognize the prevalence of it, but this line of analysis that is now coming out of these experts, they're, they're, they're frightened because of this very real, horrifying question that has to be answered. Are we experiencing a demonic overthrow in the United States of America and around the world? If you're unsure about that, let's just think on the past few weeks. We witnessed school massacres, enormous spikes in murders, and violent crimes across our city. We have an imploding border crisis. We're faced with record inflation. Calls from leaders in our government to start World War III with the biggest nuclear power on the planet. 
We have a coming famine. We have teachers grooming students. We have Supreme Court justices who can't define what a woman is. We have radical pro pedicidal abortionist. It's no longer anymore <laughs> abortion from the womb. It's aborting a baby, whether he's in the womb or out of the womb, at the will of the mother. That's what we're seeing, and that's what we're witnessing. And all of this is raising up the question before the sober-minded analyst, are we experiencing a demonic uprising within our society? And the reason this is so fascinating to me is because it flies in the face of secularism. From a secularized viewpoint, from a worldview of secularism, which, by the way, has dominated the West for well over a century, this is an absurd question. You can't even ask the question in secularism. But why? Because that society that was founded on Darwin, Marx, and Freud finds such a question nothing less than wholly irrational and utterly archaic. It's absurd because secularists have a materialistic conception of the world, which means every legitimate explanation, every legitimate cause and effect must be naturalist and materialist by definition. If it's not natural, if it's not material, it cannot be considered logical. But now, the disciples of Darwin, Marx, and Freud have demon possessions jumping up on their couches. And they're saying, we don't have a philosophy, we don't have an argument, and we can't prescribe a pill to take care of what we're seeing in medicine. Yeah. 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 Good. I thank God that today the vast majority of the world disagrees, by the way, with Darwin, Marx, and Freud. Amen. Only in America and Canada would you have such free thinkers that they lose their common sense. But 85% of the world, see this is what you never hear, 85% of the world, of the non-Western world, still believes that there is a creator who is God. Today we're seeing the collapse of radical secular thought amongst a number of intellectuals who now believe that radical sec secularism is proving itself to be the height of absurdity. So a materialistic universe is increasingly becoming uh, one where scientists and physicists find contradictions in terms that cannot defend their own existence. This this is, this is marvelous to the church. This is, a, this is a glorious understanding where the church is and the opportunities we have. But we will fail if we try to face this with a 2019 church. If we're, we're going to fill this building up with a little entertainment, sell some tickets, and pump up the smoke and the lights, we're failing the cause of Jesus Christ. In fact, the New York Times recently uh, printed an article that was stated, the growing religious fervor in American Christianity is a Jesus moment. Even the New York Times recognizes that there's something happening in the church world that most Christians don't even understand. We, we're, we're struggling to get people to come back to church. And the New York Times is saying what's happening in American culture and in the, in the American church is a Jesus moment. This is an epical moment for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they're looking at the differentiation between what's going on in Christianity and what's happening in an uprising of demonic power. Even the New York Times understands that when there's an escalation of evil, there's going to be an escalation of power from God. 
He's going to send us a voice who will penetrate those Jezebelian spirits that want to proffer up their Balak worship and he will anoint his people to confront them with signs, wonders, and miracles. Where are we? The opposing side of a demonic uprising is a great awakening. Let me try that one more time. The opposing side of a demonic uprising is a great awakening, a rally of the remnant church, a renewed church, a church full of zeal, a church full of Holy Ghost power. I'm going to say that until you get nauseated with it. It's time to take off the frills and the lace and being sweet and being kind and delicate and the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. Let's get back to the old archaic terms because that's the only thing the enemy understands. Holy Ghost. That just even sounds, you know, more crass. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you need to bear your teeth and tell the devil, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Now, Satan, I come to you in the name of the Lord and the sweet Holy Spirit. No, 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 that's not going to work. That might have worked in 2017, but that's not going to work right now. You better put on your combat boots and your camouflaged garments and you better lay off all the lace and put down your wedding dress. Not, now's not the time for a wedding dress. It's time to go to work with the name of the Lord becoming a citadel of righteousness in an evil culture and saying, I stand up for this and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I went somewhere the other day, I forgot where I was, and they wanted me to identify what pronouns I preferred to be called. And I said to them, do you, do I look that confused? I'm not even answering that question. Are you with me? I wouldn't stoop to answer that question. You may find that uh, crass and you may find that rude. I'm sorry you find that that way. But that's the truth anyhow. I know exactly who I am. I was born that way. I've never been confused about that. And I plan to bring clarity to anybody that is. Why? Because when we see this demonic force rising up, we're witnessing at the same time the archangels of God and their angelic armies becoming more involved in protecting and ministering to the faithful who are standing up for the name of Jesus Christ. If you want to see an angel of God work on your behalf, stand up against evil. And as a result, we're seeing unprecedented responses to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we're going to talk like this and we're going to... Uh, uh, dia uh, diagram uh, the conditions of our world, you do, you do understand that uh, this beautiful Ephesian letter in the fourth chapter, Paul writing to the Ephesians, he declares to them, uh, give no place to the devil. And so many in the church world, especially those uh, kind scholars from 2017 with smoke and light, but uh, 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 those, those people said that we should not give any rank our time to the enemy. We never want to talk about anything negative. We only want to talk about the good things and the positive things and the great things. We should not cast any light at all on the negative. Uh, however, if we take that out of context, we can believe that. God is not wanting us to be um, naive to the work of the enemy because it's, it's, it's the recognition of the enemy that's against you that will determine how you influence and use the weapons of war that God has given you. If you won't identify it, you'll never conquer it. And so it's important for us to understand that if we believe we're living in a supernaturally charged environment and we're standing in a place where the occult is having its way, and all hell is breaking loose, and the enemy is doing its work in the earth. You, you do understand that. 
uh, this, this little city, this sleepy town called Uvalde was invaded by a demon. And we think some moronic legislator is going to pin something that's going to stop that? You can't write a law that will prevent a mass shooting. Something, this is a sidebar, just in case some of you have drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, th- th- you'll, hear, you'll hear these, um, I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> these analysts on the news saying that America is the only place where we see mass shootings. That is historically not true. In the last 20 months, we only rank with a two and a half percentile in world mass shootings. But if you drink their Kool-Aid, they'll have you convinced that evil is good, good is evil, and they'll contort your identity until you have none so that when you lose your identity, you don't know whose you are. And when you don't know whose you are, you'll never be received by his spirit because you have no power in this earth. And you have become the slave and the serf of the enemy without ever compromising your will. He doesn't need you to sleep with another woman or another it. He, she, or them. He doesn't need you to do all that. He just needs you to not do anything. To be compliant and complacent with his work and never oppose him is enough for him. So it's important for us to understand then if this is the conditions of the end time age and 1 Peter tells us that it is, says the very elect will be lost if they do not apprehend what God has given them. So let's talk about God's response to this evil. We'll find it in the book of Acts. Acts the the second chapter, the 17th verse. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Voice, speak, audible. Your sons and daughters shall be audible. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Now, this is the specificity of the promise of the Holy Ghost. Jesus is telling us that we're going to receive the promise of the Father, which is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I and my Father are one. And he's going to send you the Comforter in my name. Why? Because the Spirit of Jesus Christ is going to be given to us substantially as the inheritance of our lot and grace in God. In other words, the Bible says that the baptism of the Holy Spirit would be the signature of our coming inheritance in heaven to give us power to work the kingdom work on earth. So here's the practical truth. When we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, We are made partakers of his divine nature through his promise of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me now? Let me me try that one more time. When we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're made partakers of his divine nature. We get a hold of, we are filled with the divine nature of God because he made a promise to us regarding his Holy Spirit. So let's look at what the Bible says about the promise of the Holy Spirit. You have 30 minutes? Let's look at what God said about the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, they broke it, Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Somebody shout, I am his people. Now, when we walk in that confidence and with that power, we stand in opposition to everything this world is seeing as the uprising of evil. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 says, You are an epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Hebrews 10, 15, wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said, therefore, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon your servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. No one is excluded. Acts 2, 15. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters. You hear the thematic, the rhythm of that thematic sound? Your sons and your daughters, your sons and your daughters, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit and they shall become an audible witness of mine. They shall prophesy. So when the Holy Spirit is promised, it's promised to all Bible believers under the new covenant made in Christ because only in Christ do we find grace. Oh, it's going to get tight right here. Only in Jesus Christ do we find grace. And grace is not some of this slick, oily. Is it all right if I'm that plain? I guess it's a little late to ask that question. Uh, grace is not this slick, oily, everything goes theology. The philosophy of life that I can do whatever I want to do. And the grace of God will be with me and covers me. And I can never forever uh, be lost from it. That is a lie from the gates of hell. Amen. And belched from <laughs> certain antiquated religions. The only place that I find grace. Now, Paul, when speaking about this, is writing about the era of grace. When, when we touch the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we not only touch the hem tide of his provision of a new covenant, but we touch the era in which that new covenant is to operate. Are you with me? So you're not living under the law trying to operate the theology of grace. You're operating the theology of grace in the era of grace. That is dunamis power. Somebody say dunamis. That's dunamis power. I have power with God and I have been given the bridle of his covenant. I have been given the reins of his covenant. I've been given the scepter of his kingship to fully function as his ambassador in this era. 
So I have the power to tell every uprising enemy, every demonic force, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Say that with me because you have that power. If you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can look at the opposition in your life and say, I rebuke you, Satan. Get thee behind me. I'm not putting up with you. I'm not having a dalliance with you. I'm not having afternoon tea with you. I'm not going to talk to you in the platitudes of kindness and grace. I'm not going to talk to you like you're my best friend's acquaintance. I'm going to talk to you like you're a demon from the gates of hell. Are you starting to flex your muscles a moment? Just you're, you're starting to work your spiritual man and put the spirit of God and the spirit of man in front of your emotions. I'm standing on absolute truth. It doesn't, have, it doesn't matter how I feel in my body this morning. It does not matter if I'm running a temperature or if I have a sore throat. It doesn't matter what kind of condition I'm in. I'm not functioning in my power. I'm functioning in the resurrected one's power. So if we believe that, then we ought to know how to explain the Spirit. The Holy Ghost comes with an explanation. And I was moved just uh, last week when we talked about it and talked about it so simply. And so many people responded so positively then. So I think that we ought to go back and rehearse the fact of what Jesus promised us. What the prophets spoke of in promise to us. What God has ordained for us, what we possess, and how to operate it. Because until you flex it and use it, it's an uncanny accoutrement in name only. Right? So I need to know the Holy Spirit in explanation. The new covenant or the grace dispensation is a period. It's an era in the redemptive work of God for the human family. Let me try that real slow. The new covenant, the new covenant, the new testament, or grace dispensation as we call it, is a period. It's a period of time. It's an era of time in which the redemptive work of God for the human family is being done in the context of that covenant. Are you with me? So we should know what the new covenant says. If we know what the new covenant says, we'll never be confused about our identity. The world is doing everything it can to subjugate you to confusion. Did you know that the new covenant stands on the authority of the old covenant? It reveals what was concealed. But within the halls of Torah, there is a curse that is levied against anybody that brings confusion over the sexes. So now it's important to understand this from an explanation standpoint because we're not reaching into something and touching it haphazardly and using it on a whim. We're standing in the middle of an era. I have permission to use the power of God in dominion. And this is where most people break down because they pray prayers as if they're not sure what God's will is. You have to know this book. You have to eat it. It's sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. You have to know what God said to you. You have to know that he said, I want you blessed and highly favored. I want you to be so blessed. I want you to be blessed in your wealth and in your health even as your soul prospers. Well, what do we have today in the church world? Broken souls. Our mind, will, and emotions are shattered. Hell has assaulted you, pummeled you, tried to force oppression on you, trying to stress you out, fill you full of anxiety, take away all of your uh, stabilizations, all of the places that you once were fixed and sure of are now uh, trembling under, under the tremulous forces of darkness. And God said, come, 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 come to me, come to me. I'm your refuge. Trust me. 
And we run into this citadel called new era of grace, this golden age of trust, this place of redemption. It's the pinnacle of the gospel. Did you know that? Your redemption is the pinnacle of God's work in this era. It's not his will that you suffer calamity to the destruction of your soul. It's his will that you walk through calamity to see his salvation. And everything that he does for you and he redeems through you is the signature of his blessing on you. Stop complaining about the circumstance and the environment and start being the change agent that walks into it. Say, well, I just don't know about that. See, this is where so many people are confused. They think that they're only safe if they're surrounded by people who think just like them, who act just like them, who know what they know, who do what they do, and maybe even drive their same kind of Prius. And then we lose our missionary zeal. We lose our missionary force. We lose our missionary call. You, you do understand what I mean, lose. We lose its function and use in our life. We have no sending. We have no going. We have no desire. We have all complacency and no thrust. So it's equivalent to us sitting on the ramp in a $2 million airplane touching the visor looking at the instrument panel, turn around and looking at the passengers. Isn't it awesome? And the passengers are looking like, yeah, but when are we, where are we going? Oh, we're not going anywhere. We're just, we're just talking about the goodness of what we have. If you're going to move in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, you have to understand the power of his redemption is in your hand and on your tongue. In fact, I quoted for you just a week or two ago that Jesus said he would give you power through the Holy Ghost to forgive their sins. We don't even function like that because we're still praying about if it's his will to heal somebody. Lord, you know, because we don't want to get boxed in. We wouldn't dare want to be a false prophet. So we just say one of those general prayers. God, if it be your will, touch him. What kind of deal is that? The Catholics have more faith than that. They give to penitence. Well, it's getting quiet. I told you I wouldn't get past the first uh, Roman numeral one. There has never been a time when the Lord Jesus Christ has endeavored to make himself known to any greater degree than in this dispensation of grace. In this grace, in this dispensation of time known as grace, mankind has been shown favor for which he is not worthy to receive. Are you with me? In this dispensation, that's why I laugh at people who tell me, well, I'm not living for God right now, but I know that during the tribulation, uh, even if I miss the rapture, I I'm going to start living for him. <laughs> God in this season is showing us more favor, the favor we're not deserving of. He's showing us so much favor that if we can't live for him now, it is highly doubtful, extremely doubtful that we will make it through the persecutions to come. This hour, we have favor unmitigated. Favor we're not worthy to receive. Favor without merit. Mercy without merit. Love without merit. Forgiveness without merit. We have everything we need and anything we've ever desired. We have it in this dispensation of time called grace. All we have to do is access it as disciples. It, it's the appropriation of God to us. It's, it's the very thing God came to give to us to deliver us and relieve us, this Gentile world, from our idolatry. It's the thing God came to give to the Gentiles that the Jews were astonished he gave away. We heard them speaking in an unknown tongue, just as we did on the day of Pentecost. 
Next week we celebrate Pentecost. We ought to know next week why we're celebrating. It's more than an encounter or an event or a one-time baptism. It's something to live in every day. I have the joy of Jesus because I have the spirit of Jesus. Yeah, but what about... No, 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 you don't understand. That's a circumstance. That's a need. That's an issue. That has nothing to do with my joy. My joy eclipses that and is exempt from that. It's not based on that. My joy is a joy that comes from above. Why? Because it has seated on my throne room. The very place where I worship, God has filled it to capacity with his spirit, not mine. Can I get a witness? So, it's in this day that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ in grace. It's in this age when divinity became humanity. It's in this dispensation that allows the unlimited to become limited. It's in this period of time when the creator became the creature, when the sinless became sin for us. It's in this dispensation and dimension of time when the Lord has opened his arms to all humanity and he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. In the gospel dispensation, not one nation is excluded from the plan of salvation. All people are invited. Do you, do you understand that? There are no barriers in this period of time. There's nothing to exclude you. I don't care what the world's told you. Nothing can keep you from running into the arms of his love and finding his great favor called grace. Nothing can stop you. Not your race, not your creed, not your color. Not your nationality, your philosophy, your degrees, your decrees, your dogmas, or your doctrines. Nothing stops you from accessing his grace. Well, they said I couldn't be included. Who are they? Identify the they. Who is they? Well, Sally. We rebuke Sally in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because she sounds like she has the same tongue as the accuser of the brethren. Well, she's my sweet sister. No, no, not, not today. If she said that, she's your opposition. You don't receive that in your spirit. You don't let that lodge in your psyche. You don't let it corrupt your logis, logos. You don't let it wreak havoc, wreak havoc in your spirit. You just simply say, that's not of God. Now, I love you, Sally, and we'll go out to eat salad after a while, but you, you're speaking like the devil. See, this is where we've got to get back to. You say, well, that's not, that's not love. No, 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 correction, <laughs> correction in love produces accountability, and it keeps people bound to a standard of excellence in doctrine. Now, the Bible didn't say that. The Bible didn't say that you got to know what the Bible says. Have you ever quoted the scripture, cleanliness is next to godliness? How many, how many have preached that? I've, I've lived that. Cleanliness is next to godliness. By God, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the devil. The Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. Anybody here? Y'all not going to help me right now. You know you told your kids that on numerous occasions when you walk into their room and they've got trash and uh, uh, last week's diapers and, uh, you know, not diapers, but their little frillies. <laughs> they got their little things hanging around and they got their pants and their shirts wadded up, piles of stuff. And you go, in the name of Jesus! Cleanliness is next to godliness. I rebuke that spirit out of this house. And then you find out one day, hey, where is that verse? And you start looking and you look. Then you break out the Greek and the Hebrew and you're looking. Now you're just looking for something associated to that. Something that meant that. You're looking for a transliteration of that. And you keep looking, and you find out it's not in the Bible. Some elder told you that. 
And they meant well telling you that. But there's no force or authority behind that. And that's what's happening with people today is we believe so many lies from culture that we've incorporated it in the psyche of how we worship. Because we feel deficient, we work, worship deficiently. Because we feel insufficient in one area of our life because culture has found fault with us, we feel less than. And so it begins to warp our concept of how God loves us because we ultimately have a warped concept of ourselves and we project that on God. He surely could not use me with unlimited grace and power and influence because after all I am. And when he comes to redeem you in this period of time, he says there's no race, there's no creed, there's no color, there's no nationality, there's no philosophy, there's no decree, there's no dogma or doctrine that can keep one person from knowing their God in this golden age if they are a seeker of truth. It's very simple, brothers and sisters. If you love truth, it can be easily found. Though fools shall not err therein. Truth is easy if you love it. It corrects us. It challenges us. It makes us better. It equips us. It acknowledges us. It affirms us. It declares our position. It declares our rank and our rule. It declares his desire for us. We have that in truth. It's very, very easy. Living for God is not hard for a truth lover. It really is not. I never wake up, not one day have I awakened with a debate within myself about what I wanted to do versus absolute truth. Absolute truth is supreme. I have to submit to that. If I don't submit that, I inherit the seed that I sow in rebellion to that truth. So, somebody say this with me. Truth is simple. It's very easy. And it's easily found. In fact, one king set up his kingdom. And he set up his kingdom in the heart of each believer. He reigns over his subjects who love him from their heart. Not an outside palace, not a, uh, a, a province of regal authority. No, no, no. He set up his kingdom inside the throne room of, of affection in our own hearts. So uh, he reigns for us. He reigns through us and he reigns over us because we become subjects of his love. If I'm in love with him, I want him to rule. And when he rules, he shares with me his majesty, his glory, and the province of his power. Through his very spirit. The Bible says uh, when the apostles were asking the Lord uh, about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, you do understand they all were convinced that he was the Messiah who would overthrow the Roman rule. And they were all, uh, they, were, they were in sorts trying to find out when he was going to come and establish that rule and overthrow the Roman Empire because certainly they wanted to be a key figure in that overthrow. They were being oppressed by Rome. They had historically been oppressed by Rome. And they were coming now to the place where they were sure this Jesus Messiah was going to be the overthrow of Pilate's and Nero's and all of the, uh, of, the, of the forces of Rome. And he says this to them. When they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the... Will thou, will you at this time? Now they move into speaking in dispensation. They want to know, is this the time you're going to restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he retorts, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. 
Don't worry about the era that you want to come. Function in the authority of the time you possess. So our king here is speaking to us and he says, I'm not here to establish a throne physically. I'm here to establish something that's much greater in power and influence. And I want to show you the beautific sound of the authority that comes from the throne of your own heart. I want to show you that it comes with authority and power. In fact, it comes with its own language. Men will marvel when you speak in its glory. Men will shout at the sound of redemption on your tongue. You will speak of those things that are not as though they are. You will prophesy the good things to come. Why is he saying that? Because he's likening it to uh, this beautiful portrait that he painted for us in Matthew 25 in the parable of uh, the men, the talents, the, the, the parable that was given to men. Do you remember that? He said a man was traveling in a far country who called his own servants, who called his own servants, and he delivered unto them his goods. It's the parable of the talents. You remember that? I'm three minutes over. Each of us, each of us are going to give an account to God of the talents we have received in this era of time, in this grace. Somebody say this with me. I am going to answer to God for my talents and how I use them in grace. In this dispensation, in this dispensation of highest favor, unequaled mercy, unparalleled love, how I live matters. Can I get a witness? We're going to give account for the talents that we have in the Lord. And when he comes physically and he returns to us, we're going to become his subjects who are going to give an account for what we have been given. How faithful were we to depend upon him? How faithful were we to call upon him? How faithful were we to, re to, to rejoice that he is our king? How faithful were we in our worship? How faithful were we in our stewardship? How faithful are we in the administration of our talents? If we're not faithful, we'll suffer the consequences. If we are faithful... We'll be qualified to rule and reign with him. So watch this now. He said, I'm going to give you power from on high. I'm going to seat it on the, heart, on, the, on the throne of your heart. I'm going to give you the ability to do everything I call you to do. And I'm even going to give you the space of time to do it in where there is exponential force and power. And then when I return, how you have lived in that period of time, will qualify you or disqualify you in my reign. So that means, if you want to break this down and look at it real carefully, we are his subjects, we function as his subjects, and we reside in this probationary position. Are you with me? We're residing in this probationary position. We're living... To prove our faithfulness and loyalty or not. And you cannot imagine how many people have proven unfaithful with a little bit of opposition. Just a little wind of opposition. Just a little worldwide pandemic. And we fall apart. The same people that were running the aisles. I'm going to leap over a troop and lean into a wall, whatever that song is. I'm going, to, I'm going to run over a troop, leap over a wall. Remember that? Nothing shall by any means hurt me. Ran the aisles. Ran the, I looked like a track meet. Where are they at? 
because they got pressed and they did not understand what it means to function in the absolute reign of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to live my life and I'm going to prove faithful and loyal to be accepted or not. And if I don't do that, I will be rejected. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 25. If you're going to be a partaker of his gospel, you're going to qualify that gospel in your life by the exhibition of your talents. That's called witnessing. People shall read you as a testimony and a witness. They're going to read you as my living epistle because you take the spiritual and apply it through your talents until it becomes practical and people can see it. The Holy Ghost does nothing for us if we don't demonstrate it. Let me try it one more time. The Holy Spirit of God is given to us not so we can walk around and tell everybody, I have the Spirit. We have to show people we have the Spirit. What do we do? We heal them. We pray for them. We minister to them. We give hope to them when hell is beating them up. We lift them. We caress them in mercy and love. We don't condemn them. We bind up their wounds. And we take them to the house of healing and say, if there's any more that needs to be done, put it on my account. We feed them. If they're hungry, we clothe them. If they're naked, we give them water if they're thirsty. This is all works of our talent, the disposition of the Holy Spirit of God that lives in us. So I don't know about you, but I make plans every day to reign with him. I'm not going to be rejected at the rapture. Because I made up my mind. I'm not living on this hope so deal. Now, if you're a gambler and you throw dice and whatever that call, you know, you isn't that that call throwing dice if you roll it out there and they get the right numbers and all that stuff. Now, if you do all that and that's the way you want to handle your eternity, I have a word for that, but I'm not going to say it right here on public television. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I can't live like that. I, I have to know. I have to live in the peace of knowing. A knowing that passes all understanding. A knowing that stands against the velocity and the winds of hell's assault. I have to know. And if you're here this morning and you want to be a child of the living God that reigns and rules with him, you're going to have to make up in your mind, I take responsibility for myself and I will make myself ready for the coming of the bridegroom. I'm, I'm going to trim my lamps. I'm going to have fuel and oil. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to make the sacrifice. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that I have been absolutely shocked at the lack of response that people have had toward their children's salvation. Saving them from the tyranny and the rape and the incestuous idolatry that's being spewed in their public schools to destroy their concepts of self, of love, of maturity, of sexual relationships, of intimacy, of personality, to rob them of their identity. And we act like we have a choice. It goes back to that make yourself ready. I'd rather wear five-year-old suits and shoes that may have a hole or two in them and make a sacrifice for my child to be saved. But we can't even make that decision. 
And we claim to have the Holy Ghost. We, we, I'm not being ugly. I'm just, I'm just trying to throw out a thought here. You're, you're, <laughs> you're arguing with yourself about what you can do to save your child. This is the same exact thing that happened with the Canaanites Molech. To appease the oppression that was coming against them, they were willing to give up in sacrifice their children. And this nation has been sacrificing its children for years. And now it's come to the doorstep of those who are called the ecclesia. Will you still throw your children to the fire? This, this is one of the provocative questions that, that is dominating the processes of thought. And we have made all types of excuses. And then we wonder why the church has failed our children. The church didn't fail your children. The church never got your children. But we're going to go and confront Jesus because we feel mistreated, feel inept, inadequate. I know that this is heavy. I know it's heavy. But I just, I have this, re this reality that I'm living with. Today is Memorial Day, or tomorrow will be Memorial Day. This weekend, there's flags everywhere. Reminding us that there are great men and women, heroic men and women that paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. It's a corollary between the Savior that we speak of who gave his all to save us and deliver us into the house of freedom. And we're going to abate and abort that freedom because of our index of convenience? Or are we going to say, Lord, I'm proving that I'm faithful and loyal. And you said that if I would put you first and serve you, you'd make a way when there seemeth to be no way. Amen. Instead of exercising power in the Holy Ghost to say, God, I cannot afford that school, but I'm going to enroll my child by faith and you will provide. Because what God will do is work on somebody else over here that doesn't even have children, but they want to be a blessing to somebody so they'll pay for a school child. That's operating in dominion through the Holy Ghost. Over here is operating by logic and self-resource. Same era, same time. One makes a decision based on his own logic. And he's going to receive the fruit of that logic. Remember, secularism is now reaping its ultimate end. And it says, we have things happening on our couches of medicine that we can't prescribe a pill for. And they're admitting that the idea that they consider to be a medieval theology and mysticism must be happening in their offices. And we're the people over here with the name, the blood, the empty tomb, the Pentecostal outpouring, the day of Pentecost, the fire of God fell and filled all of them in the upper room with his power. We have all of those experiences, the labyrinth of God and his word in our life woven into the fabric of our ephod. We worship out of revelation. We have all of that. And you mean to tell me we're going to be inept and unaccounted for? I say not. I declare the church is going to rise. Amen. And it's going to rise with such a force, a tour de force of awakening. It's going to rise with such hunger that it obliterates the darkness. It meets the darkness and obliterates the darkness. Because Jesus said, before I come back, the spirit of John the Baptist, he said it this way, the spirit of Elijah will testify of me. It's high time we wake up and we strut our shoulders back. We get a disposition of I am not taking this. 
The devil is a lie. He's the father of lies. He's a usurper of the kingdom of God. I will not tolerate his work in my life, my children's life, my family, on my job. Something happened to one of our men this weekend. He was suddenly terminated because one person was working against him. He called me and he said, Pastor, I'm, I'm shocked, but I'm not surprised. This is and this has happened. And he said, they've come to me and they've said that I have to sign this document to... Uh, to acknowledge that I quit. I resigned. And they're going to, if I'll sign the document, they're going to give me a month's wages and severance. And he said, I know what to do, but I want to call you and make sure that I'm right. I said, well, you're right. Don't sign a thing. First of all, you didn't resign. And we're not relieving them from the claim that you can make with EEOC. Or the claims that you can make with the unemployment office. We got to call this devil what it is. And I began to describe it. And he got to speak it in tongues on the other line of the phone. He, he was downcast, disheartened, and distraught. And shocked. You know how it is when somebody comes in and says, you're fired. That looks good on television, but until it happens to you. Like, hey, man, I'm happy, praise God. I had a Twinkie this morning. Jesus is good. And they come in and the devil says, you're fired. It takes the wind out of you. I said, we're not signing a thing. We're going to tell them this, this, and this, and this. And I said, then you just start praying in that office right now before you leave. Before you're boxing your stuff up, you start rebuking the devil in that office and uncover every evil thing that is designed against your blessing. My God, he got the... I could hear him on the phone. I was, I was thinking, well, not, maybe not that loud, but... You understand what I'm talking about? It's high time the church stand in its era. And we stand in our position. And we stand in confidence on the word. And we practice what we say we believe. And if we will, God will push back the darkness. He will fight our battles. He will heal our land. But we've got to be the remnant. and We've got to rise. Rise out of our couches of ease. This is not the time for ease. We've had a long run of ease. The kingdom has been at ease for a long time. But now we have a generation that does not know how to war. And we're going to teach them. And when we do, you'll see unprecedented miracles. You'll see unprecedented signs following. You'll see, uh, you'll see angels working on your behalf if you will stand up for Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. How many want the baptism of the Holy Spirit to operate freely in your life? Amen. Freely, 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 freely. Freely you have received, freely give. How many want to see the Spirit of God work in your life? It's okay to say, I'm not familiar with that. It's, it's okay to say, I'm going to investigate that. But if I find that to be the truth, I want him to work through me. If you want God's spirit to work through your life, would you just raise your hand? Now, if you have your hand raised, I'm going to ask you to stand all over this building. If you want to come down here and we'll pray for you, you're welcome to do that. But if you have your hands raised and you're saying, God, I want your favor your unrequited favor to be displayed in my life. I want what you have given me by covenant.
to function in my life. I must be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's incumbent upon us to realize there's two, there, there are three there are three uh, different panels of revelation here. Two of them are a commandment to us. It doesn't ask us how we feel. It commands us to do it. Repent and be baptized. That's a commandment to us. We're either going to do that and be obedient to it or we're not. It's our choice. But if we choose to repent, that simply means I'm acknowledging God. This idea that was born out of my flesh and this sin nature, I'm acknowledging that it, it is a reproach to you. And I want you to cover all of my sins. So it's not a matter about you being a bad person or a good person. It's not about being good or bad. It's about being born. We were born in sin. So we can't get good to get God. We have to repent of our sin nature. Then we're baptized in Jesus' name. Check it out. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 10. Everywhere they were baptized, they were baptized in the saving name of Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. What are you doing? You're being sealed in the name of the authority of the spirit that's going to dwell in you. Because that spirit comes by that name. The spirit of Jesus Christ. Corinthians, the Corinthian letter says, if that same spirit which dwelt in Christ Jesus, if it dwell in your mortal bodies, you likewise shall be raised. Then we just start worshiping him for what he's done. We don't beg him. It's a gift. It's, it's covenant. We don't beg him. I didn't learn that. I was seven years old when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it took me about ten months to figure out. I was crying and begging. <laughs> and, you know, back in that day, they, they had people screaming in this ear, hold on. And they had somebody screaming in this ear, let go. <laughs> right? It's hollering, my God, let go. Well, finally, you know, after about five months of that, I stopped and I said, which one is it? What do y'all want me to do? Do I let go or hold on? What, what is the deal? Because I was a very, <laughs> that's just the way my mind worked. I didn't understand their exuberance and their expressions of grace. But anyway, you got to get past all that. You don't, you're not begging for the Holy Ghost. It's a covenant promise. He said you're going to get it. But when you start worshiping him for his majesty and his greatness and his glory, Lord, I love you. I exalt you. I worship you. My sins have been washed away. You kept me and clothed me and you've received me unto yourself. You've baptized me in your name. You've covered me with your blood. You begin to worship him and exalt him. Then something happens in your innermost being. It's like a river that flows untapped. It's an artesian of, of, of spirit and emotion. And it starts right here by your gizzard. And it starts bubbling up and filling your life. And you might be speaking English one moment and speaking something else the next. And what happened? you got to understand this. What happens is the spirit of God invades the cavity of your throne room. He bypasses your mind. Your mind is carnal. As long as you're thinking about it, you're trying to logically deduce what's happening. Right? But when you give yourself to worship, and you begin to exalt Him. You begin to magnify Him. He gives you a language to certify to your hearing. He wants you to know, I have tamed the wildest member of your life because I now have filled you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When you get that, 
Won't anybody have to tell you how to smile, how to love, how to live, how to work, how to show mercy and grace, how to embrace strangers and love them as your own? It comes natural because the spirit man rules the premise and the affairs of your life. So if you're here this morning and you raised your hand that you want the spirit of Jesus Christ to operate through your life. You want to take dominion and authority over those cascading spirits that have come to torment your children in your house and they brought in some, they brought in some things. They're listening to some music that is not healthy for them. You're not going to win that fighting them in the flesh. They'll just hide behind the house with their little pods on. You got to whip that in the spirit. And you'll see a spiritual change in their demeanor and they'll, they'll have different affections and they'll start liking the right things and distancing themselves from the wrong things. And they won't, may not even know why, but they're finding comfort and peace and a strategy for life born out of your prayer in the spirit. So if you're here this morning and you're ready to walk in the power of God, to the, to the degree that God can ask you for anything and you give it to him. How about this? Can he ask you for your timidity? You've been telling him all these years, I'm timid and that's not my personality. Can he ask you to pray the prayer of faith with boldness for a stranger? In a parking garage or in a gasoline station? Can he ask you to pray for that mother who does not have adequate groceries that God will multiply them? And then you sit there while you're praying and watch people start bringing groceries. How much do we want God to work through us today? If we want it, we're going to have to adopt the mindset of a remnant that says we may be outnumbered. We may be the minority, but God works best when we are the minority. The prophets of Baal were screaming and cutting and worshiping and, and, and possessed and they were lacerating their lives and their blood was spilled out on the altar of their God and they had no response from their dead idol. And one man with a relationship with the power of God prayed a 63-word prayer. And the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed a watery grave. That's the same God we're serving right now. What do you need in your life? Get rambunctious with your faith right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, every person that has raised their hand as a confession of faith, that they want you to use them gloriously with the fire of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost functioning in their life for this specific time, in this era of time, to give them authority over the weapons of darkness. In the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you anoint both of their hands. You anoint both of their eyes. You anoint both of their ears and you anoint their tongue to speak the will and the words of God. Now, Lord, for everyone who is in this room and on this telecast that does not have an experience, a personal experience, with being filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, I'm asking you, Lord, to fill them according to your word. Right now, right where they are, in the name of Jesus Christ, right where you are, stretch your hands toward heaven and begin to worship God and God will fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Everything in this building that hath breath, let it praise the Lord and magnify the Lord and exalt the Lord. He is exalted. He is loved. He is adored. He is lifted up. 
Hey, thanks so much for being here with us today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at champ.org and on Facebook and Instagram at Church of Champions Houston. We believe God has something unique to say to you. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us. Have a great weekend.